<laughs> I'm going to eject you. If we... <laughs> Hi, everyone. Sorry we had to start a couple minutes late. Uh, welcome to the Tom's Hardware podcast. Uh, as always, I'm Tom's Hardware Editor in Chief, Abram Pelch, and I'm joined, uh, as always, by Raspberry Pi expert Ash Puckett and Associate Editor Les Pounder. And today we have a guest who needs no introduction Raspberry Pi founder, Raspberry Pi trading CEO, Evan Upton, and his daughter. How are you doing? Here she is. She was very keen to participate in this. Afra, I'm going to send you away if you faff about. Okay? <laughs> We oh. definitely appreciate her joining us today. Thank you. Yeah. Wait. Wait. Is she programming in MicroPython yet? She is not programming in MicroPython yet, but I think she's probably not far away from programming in, uh, in Scratch. So that'll be fun. <sighs> not bad. Wow. Yeah. Great so as well. It's, it, I mean, you know, I, I mean, it, it kind of goes without saying uh, for folks who are familiar with Raspberry Pi, but like, you know, it's been a great tool for, for kids, it's a great tool for kids. It's been a great tool for me with my son. We do like nothing but Pi projects all the time. Now we're going to be mixing in some Pico, Pico projects. Uh, he and I, he's eight, and he programs in MicroPython, and yeah. like, and he and I were like working on. I showed you this before, working on this our first uh, Pico project, where it's just like a Simon game where the different uh, LEDs light up different colors, and you got to use the joystick to match them. We're almost. We're I almost age, right. I mean, I think eight is a great age to start getting involved in that because you're, you know, a little bit, you know, you know some math, um, and you've got the kind of. I mean, a lot of it's actually mechanical dexterity. I think that's one of the reasons why you scratch is so good for younger people. Uh, <laughs> why scratch is so good for younger people is because you don't need to be able to hit keys on the keyboard. Um, so you know, you can do it with just kind of dragging things around. So. But by eight years old, people can hit the keys reliably. And so you don't have that kind of frustration factor that comes with trying to do text based programming when you're just that little bit younger and a little bit clumsier. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's cool. I mean, he's constantly trying to push me to do stuff. It's like, hey, what if we made a robot that used OpenCV to recognize someone's face and then it drove toward them and stuff? And like, you know, we're like, yeah, okay, I'll have to figure that out. We'll have to figure out how to do that, do that tomorrow. So, it really helps us push the envelope. So speaking of pushing the envelope, this is such an exciting time. Raspberry Pi Pico, a completely new new platform. What made you just, I'm just curious, how long have you been working on this and what made you decide that it was time to, to come out with it? Well, so the team's been working on this, I guess for a couple of years. Um, it's been a, um, I mean, it's a complicated business, right? I mean, building, um, yeah, building this kind of platform is not, straightforward i mean obviously you know you have to remember is that this is a relatively um a relatively simple device afra if you want quiet that's fine call. um it's a relatively straight a simple device compared to the devices that are in the um are you gonna, are you gonna extract my daughter no, yes, please, yes. i'm doing the tom Tyler thing she's she's actually been very well behaved do not kick my shot <laughs> no. this is the life we live it's this is it this is the life we chose. That's not the quote. Um, yeah, this is this this is. <laughs> so, so look, it's a um, it's a um, I'm gonna I'm gonna wantonly drink champagne. Um, yeah, this is a simpler device um, than the um, main processor in the Raspberry Pi. You know, there's, there's kind of, it's interesting, you know, I mean, we made a bit of a joke about the, the, the fruit-based silicon companies. Um, but, you know, it's interesting when you compare this device to a um, to an M1. If you compare this device to, to, to the Apple M1, um, you have roughly a thousandth the number of uh, transistors uh, on this device. You have roughly 12 million. Um, roughly, this is a memory-dominated device. One of the interesting things about what we built is that it's um, it's got a, a lot of memory. In it, so it's got... Um, uh, two megabits, it's got 256K, two megabits of, of, of main memory. Um, those are six, there are six transistors per memory cell, so there are 12 million transistors. And I believe that the, and the device is almost entirely consistent. Um, and the, uh, I believe the number that was quoted for, um, uh, for, for M1 was that it was 12 billion uh, transistors on five nanometers. So this is a 12 million transistor device um, on 40 nanometers versus a 12 billion 
transistor device or five nanometers. Um, that doesn't mean it's a simple device to develop. There's an enormous amount of intellectual power. Fireman has got into making this. Um, it's an amazing team at Raspberry Pi who's worked on it. Um, and we, I, no, I really do think that it's, 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 I think it's the best microcontroller you could have made, actually. It's, it's really an enormous amount of effort. Um, and there's just kind of attention to detail. So you know, I think when we, um, it's a hard thing to get across. And obviously, we've spent some time playing with it now. So I think you're probably starting to get a feel um, for the device. But it's a, um, it's a, it's hard to get across in numbers. What an interesting device! What an interesting device! Is. Um, yeah, particularly if you look at the. The way the bus fabric works on the device, you know, you have two processor cores, you have a DMA read channel, you have a DMA write channel, and all of those things can be working um, independently. You, know, you can arrange to get all of the performance out of both cores, all of the read performance out of the DMA, all the write performance out of the DMA, and all of those things can happen at the same time. Actually. And a lot of attention went into making sure that was the case. Obviously, PIO is this, this programmable I.O. subsystem. I don't know if you've had a chance to play with it yet. Um, but, you know, there is this wonderful, and I think probably the most innovative thing in the chip, which lets you um, bit back this idea that, you know, a lot of what people do with um, microcontrollers is microcontrollers come with a fixed set of peripherals. And there's an enormously rich world of taking microcontrollers and doing things with them that, they weren't supposed to be useful. So, for example, the two, this thing called 2006 Raspberry Pi. Um, if you go look on our blog, there's a, a thing that I built back in 2006, um, which is a, a piece of variable about this size. It has an Atmel microcontroller, same microcontroller that's used in the, the kind of classic Arduinos. Um, and that's bit banging video. That's generating a video signal. It's controlling a half, half megabyte, 512K. Um, SRAM, and it's generating the video signal out to a power television. Um, so there's a lot of this kind of world of bit banging things. And what we've done is we've kind of formalized that with this PIO peripheral, which automates a lot of the low level bits um, of controlling a, a an arbitrary um, a protocol out on the wire uh, and lets the cortex processes focus on. You can just pump pump words into PIO, so I'm using, often using the DMA. Uh, pump words automatically into the PIO and hand it off the fine container and control um, uh, kind of an arbitrary protocol. And we've used, yeah, we've got some great demos. I think we did a Bad Apple demo. We did a, a demo of playing the Bad Apple video at 1080p60, where the PIO is pretending to be an SD card controller, reading data in from an SD card, where it's pretending to be a, a display controller and writing VGA data out. It's also pretending to be an I2S controller and writing audio data to an I2S controller. So it's, it's a... It's lovely, actually. Long answer, short question, long answer. It's taken a long time. It's an amazing theme. Um, and I think the, the outcome has been really, really good, actually, really positive. Definitely. You know, one thing that I think is most exciting about the Pico is just the development of the RP2040 chip. And I want to know what led to the decision to use ARM when creating the RP2040. Um, it's interesting. The ARM... We've had a few people ask us questions about that. There's, um, I mean, Risk Five is obviously the now the 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 kind of alternative architecture of choice. Um, I think that um, what ARM has given us is, I mean, they're amazing cores. I think it's I think it's very, um, you know, ARM have done a great job in. You can kind of pick three tiers of ARM core. So you have the the in order cores. Um, so that's the ARM eleven. That we used in Raspberry Pi One, the ARM A7 that we used in Raspberry Pi Two, and the 53 that we used in um, Three and Three Plus, um, and those are all very. They tend to be developed in Cambridge. They're all very, very strong cores. They're um, uh, they're general purpose application processor cores, um, and ARM have got very, very good at doing that. And certainly, A53 and its successor A55 um, are. What's interesting is they're in order cores. Right? They're not. They're not out of order cores. They're, they're kind of like um, kind of like a Pentium. Uh, so they're the superscalar in order cores, um, and they are—they've taken in order superscalar performance way beyond where, say, Intel ever got. Where Intel went out of order with um, Pentium long before they went got to the levels of um, IPC that um, it's brought. So they've been very good at that. Um, they're getting better at the out of order cores. So A seventy two, I think, which we use in Raspberry four, is the best. Uh, it's, it's kind of the first really strong out of order. 
Um, and then you have the market control cards. And certainly, you know, sort of M0 plus, um, M4, I guess maybe M33. Um, those are really, really strong market control cards. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important not to, not to, not to understate the value simply of the IP. But also, obviously, access to the instruction set, producing uh, something which is ARM compliant, ARM compatible, um, plugs you into this just as most enormous ecosystem. Um, you know, billions, tens of billions of devices that have been sold um, that, that, that run ARM code from one form or another. Um, and, you know, we couldn't turn our back on that. Um, so I think you get great cores, you get great cores in reasonable price, and you know, it's not expensive to run products. Um, and, and just participate in this enormous ecosystem, and of course, in a, an ecosystem that, in a different way, with the A plus cores, uh, we're in part of. So, we have a, a question from a viewer uh, What made you release the chip openly to other board manufacturers from day one? Um, we, we, well, obviously, the people, so people we've released the board to, the, the chip to, um, uh, Pimeroni, um, Adafruit, uh, SparkFun, uh, and Arduino. Uh, and those are all uh, those are all companies we've got long-standing relationships with. And Arduino's an interesting one because, of course, in a lot of ways, we were inspired by what Arduino have done. Um, so, so these are companies that we we have relationships with, that we admire, um, that build interesting products, and we just kind of didn't want this. Um, yeah, Pico is a fantastic product. I mean, I think we've, we've done a good job with Pico, um, but. We didn't want to kind of make RP2040 just a chip for doing Pico with. We think it's relevant to other people. Um, and so we got into the hands of, it, it would have been hard to get into the hands of everybody on day one. And part of me wants to wants to get into the hands of everybody. We will get there. Um, but uh, we just got into the hands of the people we had relationships with and who we admired. And I think the products that they produced already um, are, are kind of a, a, will kind of validate that decision. Interesting people. So, Evan, I noticed um, of the announcement we said that Arduino was involved, and there were two things that my ears pricked up for. Number one was Arduino's involvement from a software level. They're going to have an Arduino core for the RP2040, so you can use the IDE. That's right, isn't it? Yes. So that's 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 a big thing, because uh, I noticed when we're looking through for our tutorials for the site, the, the C element was quite more was more complex than the the micro Python side. Now you you obviously you're pitching micro Python as the language for beginners to get their you know, to get a handle on the board with. Yeah. So it was interesting to see Arduino coming on board, but it also got me thinking about Arduino's involvement. They have you know their own board, their own form factors, which I've luckily I've got a desk full of micro oh, controllers. Yeah. At the, the cla That's a classic. That's an R two Uno. That's old. Yes. Very old. Um, the, it, it, with a dip, with a dip chip on it, rather than uh, SMT. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I've got some spare dip chips. Well, in case I was we're going to, we're going to make a fair in the autumn of 2011 uh, in New York mm -hmm. and seeing a kid who built a doll's house. There was, and this was I had like one of ten. We were kind of basically standing for the first half of the thing. We were just standing at a desk, just standing there waiting for someone to bring us a monitor. I think so we could demo it. Um, and, and there was a kid next to us who built a doll's house that was automated to do something like that. Uh, and that was kind of the point where I think we realized that um, kids were interested in this stuff. It was always the risk early on in the that kids weren't interested in electronics mm -hmm. and, and, and programming, uh, that, that I'd been a fad. And I'm just, it's mm -hmm. fad. That was the, that was the board that convinced us that when we launched Raspberry Pi the next year, we might actually have something which was relevant to education. It's good to see that. It leads me to think, though, um, the Arduino form factor, how the Arduino chip is there, the Atmel chip, and we've got the RP2014, and Arduino's got their own board, the Connect board they're working on. Could we see a shift now to Arduino using more RP2040-based boards and sort of moving away from Atmel? Or I, I don't know if that's a question for Arduino. Um, I'll supply Arduino with as many 2040s as they want for as many form factors. As they want. <laughs> they're an amazing company. We think we've got an amazing chip. Uh, and we'd love to. We'd love to do more. So, speaking of speaking of the chip, this is the first Raspberry Pi silicon. Um, you now you're able to go out and license it. Do you see yourself possibly moving up the stack and creating Raspberry Pi silicon for a regular Pi? Well, I think it's two orders of magnitude difference. 
Um, you know, okay, it's it's not it's not the three orders of magnitude difference you might think of if you look at the difference in transistor count between the M1 and the, and the R2040. Um, but they are. I mean, I've been involved in the development of every um, application processor for a Pi platform since 2009. So, um, 2708, 2709, 2710 for Raspberry Pi 1, 2, 3, uh, and then 2711 for Raspberry Pi 4. Um, they are enormously powerful. Um, devices, interesting complicated devices. One thing I actually really like about 2040 is they are, 2040 is kind of perfect in a way that an application processor can never be, because uh, an application processor is simply too large um, to, to ever be, to ever have had every detail that polished to a kind of a gleaming shine. 2040 really is polished. Um, and so, but they are enormously complicated. You need hundreds. I remember I wrote the, um, when I wrote the for launch post in the June 2019, uh, I, we always have a credits list and the RP, the Pico launch post has a credits list. The Pico launch post credits, credits list is about this long, on the screen. it's about 50. Um, the Raspberry Pi 4 credits post was 300 people before I put anyone on who worked for Raspberry Pi. So yeah. simply the people working at the other, silica, uh, the other suppliers, particularly, um, that was 300 people. Um, it's enormous. I mean, it's it's vastly complicated to build these, to build these devices. So, no, I think it's, the simple the, the short answer to that is no. Um, I don't think it's easy for an organisation like Raspberry Pi to build a team which is large enough to build the course of Raspberry Pi. So we have a, another viewer question: Is it Raspberry Pi's business to make more Pico formats? Oh, sorry. Is it Raspberry Pi's business to make more Pico formats? Um, I don't think we want to make very many Pico formats. We might do one or two, um, but really the plan is to make the chip available and let other people innovate. Um, you can see this with, Raspberry, with mainline Raspberry Pi. We don't make vast numbers of formats. We make. I guess we've got up to kind of three or four formats now. So you have the B product. You have the A product that shows up sometimes, doesn't show up in every generation. You have the hundreds products, so the, the 400. Uh, and you have the compute level. Um, and so we kind of try to be quite parsimonious, and that's taken us eight or nine years to get to a point where we have three or four form factors for the, uh, for, for the core product. Um, so we might we might add one more form factor for Pico, um, but I think mostly it's that little part that is the How has the Pico, as we know it today, and now that it's officially released, how has it changed since it was first conceptualized? Like, were there any ideas that didn't make its way to the final design? Um, I think there were some there were some ideas about um, battery. So there were some ideas about battery connectors, um, and it's a so the power chain probably. I mean, you look at Pico; it's largely a breakout board for um, for RP twenty forty, and of course you can see from how simple it is and how well it works on two layers that the board itself was co-designed with the package. And of course, because it's a simple package, the package was co-designed with the die itself. Um, so you've kind of got a level of that kind of level of vertical integration, that kind of fruit company level of vertical integration. It's pretty, pretty obvious when you look at the layout. Of the um, beyond being a, just a breakout board for the for the core silicon, um, it, it has um, an interesting power chain. So it has this butt boost. We have a rich butt. Uh, but there's converter on there, so you can feed either more than so to generate 3v3, which is the rail from which all the models are You can feed either less than 3v3, in which case you boost, or more than 3v3, which gives you buck. Um, there was some thought about whether to put battery charging, put LiPo management on the board, um, and I think we couldn't find a cost effective way to put kind of very broad voltage, broad supply voltage. Um, and the uh, and, and the light bulb, um, and, uh, in a good price point. Um, and then, of course, there's the question about what kind of connector do you put on there. Um, I like that Pico has this, these castellated edges and very low Z height. And of course, as soon as you start thinking about putting a battery connector on there, you can the Z height. So um, you can build nice battery management stuff around the, the power pins, the power pits, and the power pins. In the top, top right hand corner of the board uh, are designed to allow you to build a number of um, 
battery architectures on there, but you need some off, uh, you need some off board um, component uh, to manage the charge and discharge. That's probably the biggest thing. Um, big, some questions about castellation. Um, castellation was a late addition to the design. It was originally a very, just a pure kind of dip um, packet, a pure dip board. And then the castellations, I kind of thought the castellations would make it look terrible, kind of make it look kind of ragged. Um, uh, but in the end, I think it's ended up keeping, keeping the time. Great. By the way, we've had uh, some requests that uh, Evan try to get closer to the microphone because it's getting okay. a little bit, a no little, okay. little bit, a um, little uh, bit. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, once I know you had a question you were going to ask. Yeah, it's been less than a week since Pico was introduced to the world, but we're already seeing some really interesting projects. So, I've got on my second screen right now two projects that are really interesting to me because I'm a retro computer aficionado. So I've got the BBC Micro emulated on Pico hardware. Yeah. And I've also got what is quite frankly a frightening screensaver of you bouncing around the screen, Evan, with raspberries around. Oh, that. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Luke Ren wrote that. that. I me. I mean, I was, uh, <laughs> but we, we've seen 1080p video um, black and white rendered on the Pico. We've mm -hmm. seen BBC Micro emulated, and we've got this screen save, which is 800 by 480 at 60 frames a second, Yeah, all from a $4 board. I mean, what projects have you seen that could possibly top what I've seen already? Um, well, I've seen more emulation projects, so there'll be more emulation um, coming Commodore out. Commodore 64? Uh, I've not seen Commodore 64, but I've seen a number of other popular 1980s 8-bit platforms emulated on it, and I'm sure they will see quite <laughs> a day at some point. Um, nice. The ones that are the ones that were popular in the UK, which kind of, if it's not a B or a C64, it narrows it down, right? Um, <laughs> it does a bit. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, it's a Dragon 32. Um, no, but, um, so, so there are more emulation ones. Um, the There's a little bit of a, um, there was a bit of reluctance to release too many of these things because this is a microcontroller, right? It's a it's designed for doing microcontroller -y things, and I think there was a concern that if we release too many, we have some more. If we release too many of these things which are graphics focused, um, then it kind of tends to blur the lines between Pico and Zero. It tends to make it feel a bit more like, a, you know, a Raspberry Pi has always been a multimedia platform. You know, the first demos we ever did were Quake Three demos, right? Um, and so there was always there's there is a little bit of a concern that we shouldn't chuck out too many emulator demos. Um, on the other hand, we have a bunch of them and they're great. Um, the DVI, you mentioned the screensaver. Um, the, um, the ability to drive DVI was a real surprise with this platform. That, um, VGA, uh, VGA resolution DPI requires a 252 megahertz bit clock. And um, given we closed timing on this chip at 133 megahertz, it was a little bit of a surprise. To us, the, mm. really, the vast, vast, vast majority of silicon was fine at 252. You know, there's so much margin, there's so much padding in the timing recipes on these devices um, that almost everybody, unless you have a synthetic which slow piece of silicon, almost everybody can go to 252, which gives you good job. Um, so I think we might see a little bit more, we might see a bit more focus on that, because I think that's, that's interesting. I, I like the idea that you can use a microcontroller. It's almost compliant, even the very, very simple. Um, uh, interface to the DVI connection is very close to real compliance. Um, so I think we might see a little bit more focus on that. So um, how would, if someone was asking you, how would they, how would you, what what would you tell them to use a Raspberry Pi 04 versus a Pico? Um, I'd say anything that needs to really talk to a screen user zero uh, and anything that needs to talk to analog or needs to interact with the real world in very real time. So it needs to have deterministic real time behavior. I'd say use a Pico. Uh, and I'd say if you need both of them, use both. Um, yeah, this is a device which has been designed to sit next to a big Raspberry Pi and provide the things that a big Raspberry Pi can't do. Um, I want to piggyback a little bit on Les's questions about projects that you've come across, because I know that we're still really early in its release and yeah. we're going to see all kinds of stuff come through but so far have there been any unexpected uses of the pico that you've seen 
it hasn't been in people's hands, I think, for long enough for that to happen. I mean, I've been amazed how much performance kind of uh, early beta testers have been able to get out of it. Um, I mean, the DVI thing was genuinely enormously surprising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody has spent a lot of time shipping chips that have HDMI controllers in them um, that you can bit bash this out of cheap, very cheap microcontroller. Um, it's very surprising. Um, I think we'll see. It'll be like Raspberry Pi, right? It'll be the yeah, you know, we'll we'll end up seeing things like you know, I don't want to go back to the cucumber sorting, but um, yeah, the cucumber sort um, is is um, still for me emblematic of um, what's good about Raspberry Pi, right? That you make general purpose computing. You know, we believe we believe in making general purpose computing hardware, um, and if you make general purpose computing hardware in any kind of price performance bucket, um, people will do stuff with it you can never imagine. Uh, but you know, like I said, you know, we are where we four days in, four and a half days in, so um, we're not there yet. So um, I would, I was going to ask about the decision. I mean, this is probably cost saving, but decision not to not ship it with the pins pre-soldered. Yeah. Some of this was about. Um, so I got sent a bottle of champagne to um, my directors to congratulate. I thought it was an appropriate time to drink it. Um, the um, uh, I like the Z height. Um, you know, same with zero, right? Um, there is a uh, there's a cost reason not to do it because you save yourself the component. You also save yourself an assembly step. So, like zero Pico is a single sided board, so it just goes through the oven once. It comes through on panels of um, twenty four boards. Uh, in the case of uh, I don't know the, what, what the panelization for zero is. I think I have it in mind. It's either twelve or fifteen. And on Pico, the panelization is 24. So it comes through 24 on a kind of an A4 sized um, uh, 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 sheet of PCB. Goes through the oven once, uh, and then you break them out and you're done. Um, if you put through hole components on, then like a, a header, you've got to go through the either wave solder or selective solder, so it's an extra process step. Um, you then end up with an object which is physically larger. So one of the nice things about um, uh, Pico is we ship them on reels. So they're physically very, very tense. Um, uh, and, and you'd give that up. Um, so that's the thing. Uh, what we have done is we've talked to our approved brew sellers and we've encouraged them to, if they do choose, because of course they can choose to um, pre populate headers. Um, what we've done is we've encouraged them to populate with male headers that point downwards. Um, so I turned it into kind of a dip, a dip form factor. Um, so we've kind of tried to, tried to create a standard, try to promulgate a standard. Um, so that when people build accessories, they can be confident of what they need to put on the accessory board, not just putting a female connector, um, in order to um, connect to a to a Pico. And we may in the future do a Pico H. What would we call a Pico H? Like we have the zero W H. Uh, we may do a Pico H. Yeah, that's one of the areas where Les and I had a uh, Les turned out to be right, but we had a creative disagreement because when I got mine, I soldered the pins the opposite way. And he soldered it the the correct way, yeah. but the reason I did that was because the the markings for the for the GPIO pins are all are all on the bottom, yeah. so I figured it'd be easier to to see what I was doing. I I, I could see us growing diagonal numbers, um, teensy does this quite well. Have little diagonal uh, numbers next to each um, uh, next to each through hole pad. Uh, I could see us growing those on the top. I'm not sure if there are things that get in the way, but I think we could probably afford to do that. Can't probably fit the full labels on, but we can, we can fit numbers on at least. Yeah, uh, but it's uh, you know it's 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 easy enough to do the other way. I I I foresee obviously we're already seeing from Pimeroni a, a huge ecosystem of products, and I can foresee everywhere that Arduino has been uh, that this this board going. Uh, so, uh, oh. we love them, right? I mean, PIM are fantastic, and we all, you know, we, we've got four great launch partners for this silicon. Um, but you know, I mean, PIM just they're, they're like a machine, right? I mean, I, I still remember seeing Paul in when was it? It's got to be June of 2012. No, because you know, Paul designed our logo, um, long before yep. he founded PIM, he designed our logo. Um, 
and we met up with him in Sheffield at the, um, there's an old steelworks that's been converted into kind of an exhibition space there. And we were there for a retro gaming um, exhibit. And he was there and he had this prototype of the pie boat. And he had it just like looking at us. And this kid, this girl, 10 years old, walked past and just, she saw it and her head just went like, like that. She just like, heads just snapped around and looked at her. And I'm like, <laughs> it's before they founded the company, before he founded the company. I'm like, these guys are going to make a heap of money. They're going to make a big, big business. And make a big money. Um, it's been wonderful to see Pimeroni grow. And of course, you know, they were they were some of the first people we wanted to tell. I, I'm not good at keeping secrets. Um, Paul was in the office and I was like, just go and look at that. Because they've been <laughs> doing a product called 32 Blit, which is a, um, they've got this Pico system product they've built on 2040. But they have a larger product called Pico system. Uh, no, sorry. 32 blip um and i was like paul just go and look over there on that monitor and i think it had the bouncing heads demo or one of the other early uh one of the early just video out there was on it just go look go look at that we'll talk about it in six months and i'm just amazed at what they've done and P uh, pico system is is going to be amazing you might have just answered the question i have but i do want to know well, first i'm re i know that a lot of people are appreciative that you got the rp 2040 in the hands of third-party developers before releasing the Pico because we have so much to choose from. It makes it a lot easier to jump in and get started. So with that being said, are there any particular third-party accessories that you're looking forward to that may not have been released yet? Um, I think there are there are other Pimeroni things that aren't on in the blog post. So there's, I think, a unicorn hat. And there's a scroll hat. So, you know, they do a big line of these grids and LEDs. Um, so I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to that coming out. Um, the um, I don't think they've yet launched the um, the VGA board. So there's a board which yeah. is a version of our board. So we did a yeah. uh, Mike Simpson at Pi did a, a demo board. Um, oh, there we are, that looks familiar. Um, so they did a demo board, um, and then Pimeroni have taken that and they've applied that kind of oh blind me um <laughs> all blind me um the they've done a post of it and they've applied their pimmer any done in black piece mm. of it, they've applied their kind of pimmer any um design uh, uh, aesthetic to it um so that's that's a fun one and of course that's the one that unlocks by the time that launches we have to we haven't released all of the we haven't released the bbc micro emulator we haven't released the other emulators we haven't released the bad apple stuff um so there's a um, there, there's a heap of work we need to do on the video side before they get that. So looking forward to those. Um, I'm looking forward to getting RP2040 to more people as well. So um, uh, you know, there's there's a world of you know the lesson of Raspberry Pi is when you make a good platform, you put it in the hands of people, they do amazing stuff. Um, we've done what we can with getting RP2040 to people, uh, but next quarter when we can actually get volume silicon um, to a bunch of makers, I'm sure they're going to do some stuff. So um, we have time for one more question. I think this is the uh, I think this is a question a lot of people would have, which Pimeroni sort of has an answer for because they are coming out with a Wi-Fi board. Uh, Baz Channel asks, any plans for Pico W with with Wi-Fi? Uh, not at the moment, but we do hear people asking. Uh, it's the obvious thing that we it's the obvious thing that the board doesn't do. Um, it's a capability we have. Obviously, we do. We do a zero W and all of the big Raspberry Pi products since 2016 have Wi Fi. Um, so it's a thing we're interested in. There are some architectural challenges in that all of the products we do with Wi Fi at the moment are Linux products. Um, and therefore, the software architecture for doing Wi Fi on a microcontroller would be very different. And so there's a piece of work we need to do that. Um, but we are interested in it. We hear people asking for it. Obviously, in the short to medium term, it's something that's going to be um, dealt with by partners, either with accessories, Pimeroni, uh, or um, uh, on a RP2040 based product like the uh, like the Arduino product. So we think people are going to be well covered. Um, I suspect at some point we will we'll go and look at something like that. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Evan, for joining us. This is such a always of such a privilege to have you, and and we're so excited about the Pico. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for um, thank you for providing an audience for my co-conspirator. <laughs> so until my mother appeared, uh, usually, the, cat, the cat is usually the honourable co-conspirator. 
I, I'm sure if my if I didn't have a door on this room, my one year old would come in, and if I didn't, and if he didn't have school, my eight year old would come in because he's really excited about the Pico uh, and about Raspberry Pi in general. It's something that we do together every day, so it's really something that I think brings brings families together among many other things. Open plan living, you see. Open, open plan living is great. For that, it? Yep. So. It? So every uh, so thank you to our viewers. Uh, of course, uh, you can find us here every week at 7:30 GMT, 2:30 p.m. Eastern Time, and on YouTube, Facebook, and wherever uh, wherever podcasts are. And of course, if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button so you can get alerted. See you next week. Bye.